morning, Brother Minor, to open us up in prayer. I'll try. Your yeah. voice is still a little down? Still bad. Sorry. It's okay. You want to try or not? I'll, I'll I don't want to put you on the spot. No, that's okay. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Yes. Thank you that you do own everything. Mm -hmm. Because you made it all. Yes. Thank you most of all for your son, the Lord Jesus, yes. that you gave to us. Thank you for salvation mm -hmm. and the one who paid the price Amen. of our sin. Amen. Thank you for this gathering. I pray that your name would be lifted up in all we do and say. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 354. What a friend we have in Jesus.
little out of whack. I, I left my real list at home, and so I was trying to think of uh, the announcements I wanted to give tonight. Um, the first one is, there's a sign-up lead in the back there on the counter for July 1st. If you have not signed up, now let me be very stern about this, then you're not invited. Okay? Now, I, I, want to be, I want you to understand this. We were invited to this, and so you just can't show up. They want to account. And so if you're coming, put your name on there. That's all we're asking. And so I can let them know. You'll have until the end of the service next Sunday that I'm going to let him know at least a week ahead. You know, I'm early for everything. So anyway, the second thing is, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I have to look at my wife. She'll telepathically give it to me, and we'll be good. Oops, I got nothing. We have the men's. And oh, that's what it was. And then we have uh, two weeks from now, we're going to have a, um, a, a short business meeting. I promise you it will not be over 10, 15, 20, 30, 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All we're addressing in this business meeting, as if you were saying, the last one, we had talked about some financial things. I have went and, and got all the answers we needed. And it's, it's not going to take, you know, going to the business meeting and, <clears throat> and tell you and then you make sure that your approval is on that and then we can move ahead. And so, just to let you know, it will be brief. I don't think, unless you love the talk, it'll be over 15 minutes. <laughs> and so, um, anyway. All right. Um, we're not going to take the, an offering now. We'll take it at the end of the service. So, I, I do want to say this. Don't be intimidated to see the offering plate come by. I'm sure the evangelist will not matter <laughs> to him if you are, but um, I don't do this to, to milk you. It's just if anybody did not have the money, did not have an opportunity to give this morning, it gives you the opportunity in the evening, okay? And so with that said, um, we'll ask the evangelists to come on and, and have their special, and then we'll go into the message. First, I want to say thank you so very, very much, uh, Harbor Baptist Church, for inviting us, and thank you for the Beautiful accommodations that we have. We really enjoyed it, and uh, um, the beautiful and wonderful hospitality that we've received from Pastor and Vera. Yes. Did you stay at the Hilton Hotel? No. <laughs> they won't let us go there. They won't let us. We don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's beautiful. We had a wake up, and there's a beautiful lake there, and it's it's lovely. So we just thank you so much for. The way you've treated us, we really appreciate that so very, very much. And thankful that uh, you've allowed us to come and preach and sing and uh, get to know you a little bit, get introduce ourselves to you and you to us. And um, your folks are, are a, a wonderful, lovely bunch of people. And we pray nothing but God's best for this church. Mm -hmm. And I will be keeping this church in prayer and keeping in touch with Pastor Rowan and sending him some texts and uh, hopefully encouraging him in uh, the ministry here at uh, Nanaimo. Here's a song that I wrote, uh, must be 97 or 8 years ago now, but uh, it's just a song, you know, regarding prayer. We sang, what a friend we have in Jesus, and the emphasis is really about prayer. And um, so the song's about prayer, and I I'm reminded that Martin Luther one time said, I've got so much to do today that I'll spend the first three hours in prayer. So Martin Luther knew the secret of prayer he felt like, uh, you know, if you're going to chop down a tree, if you have a dull axe, you don't get very far. But take the time, sharpen the axe, slice through the tree. And that's the way it is in our life. We spend time in prayer, especially when it comes to um, the thought of revival. Um, we can't have revival, dear friends, unless we are going to be consciously making an effort to seek God for revival. And I believe... That if we will do that, he will meet our, he'll meet our needs. He's, he's promised to do that. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, will, first of all, humble themselves. We spoke about that this morning. And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. The Bible says, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Well, I don't want to go into preaching right now, but I'll, I'll just do the song. I got so much to do today I need a little time to pray I don't know how to make it So Lord, I'm going to take it I need a little time to pray 
time to get my ducks all in a row. Time to line up my heavy load. No better time to start with the horse feet for the cart. I need a little time to pray. Oh, kneeling on the floor by your bed. At the table, fold your hands, bow your head. We're all straight on the ground. Let me tell you what I found. I need a little time to pray. Trouble comes a knocking at your door. The devil tells you what he has in store. Oh, no time to hesitate. It's time to supplicate. I need a little time to pray. A sister comes, she's hurting and in tears. Oh, Brother says life's giving him the gears. Tell the Lord their needs. It's time to intercede. I need a little time to pray. Oh, kneeling on the floor by your bed. At the table, hold your hands, bow your off straight on the ground. Let me tell you what I found. I need a little time to pray. I got so much to do today. I need a little time to pray. I don't know how I'll make it. Oh, I need a little time to pray. If you have your Bibles, ask if you turn with your, in your Bibles to the book of Luke and chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Very popular story, and it's known as the prodigal son, but I need to preface the story, first of all, from a story of my own. Um, many years ago, my daughter was at church, and uh, a preacher came to the church where she was attending, and um, was basically sharing his testimony, and he had a little book. And uh, he had that book for sale, and so my daughter bought the book and thought that I might be interested in reading it. And it was called Wednesday's Child, as a child of woe. And the story started off with him just as a very little boy. He was a, a, a boy that um, was raised without a dad, and the mother raised the boy, and especially at that time, it was considered inappropriate. By the way, it's still is inappropriate, but it doesn't have the stigma today that it had back then. So the boy was treated harshly, even as a young, very young boy. And then at a certain point when the boy was about four or five years old, she married a man and the father, this man, raised this boy as his son. But the boy, the father was a drinker and he was cruel, very cruel. And, uh, the boy would go often without the necessities of life. And very often, the boy would just get beat for no reason at all by the dad. Sometimes when he was in a drunken stupor. And sometimes, just in blind rage, he would beat this boy up. He would come home at night. He would go into the boy's room and just beat him. Now, the boy was nor abnormally small for his age. And he was one of those boys that when he got to 10 or 11 years old, he was still very small. And so the dad continued to beat the boy. Well, time went on, and then he had one of those years where he grew very 
big very quickly, which sometimes happens. And uh, as I'm reading this book, I'm thinking to myself, I can picture what's happening. The dad is getting older, and so is the boy. The dad is getting less vigorous and less strong, and the boy is getting stronger. And I see how the, 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 pic, the, the thing is unfolding, and I'm thinking to myself, as this boy gets older, sooner or later, the, the things are going to turn, tables are going to turn. Well, the boy gets to be about 15 years old, and he's getting pretty big, and still the dad is beating him, but not near as much. And then the boy gets to be about 18 years old, and he's a full-grown man. I mean, he's shaving, and he's, uh, he's working, and he's getting stronger. And I'm thinking to myself, now, now that dad is going to get what he deserves. And, you know, we're constantly inundated with this, this theme in Hollywood where we just can't wait to see vengeance served. And the dad, he ends up getting very sick, getting cancer. The mother had passed away, and so now it's just these two. And I thought to myself, what's the boy going to do? But you know what that boy did? He took care of that dad. And there was a part of me that was disappointed, thinking to myself, he doesn't deserve to live. He doesn't deserve to be treated like that. He was showing grace by the boy, and he took care of him in, in, in ways we couldn't even imagine, you know, cleaned him up and wiped him up and, and fed him and took care of him until he died. And I think that that's a demonstration of grace, an unusual demonstration of grace. And if we're going to read this story correct, it's going to speak to us about grace. It's going to give us a deeper understanding of grace. Let's look at the, a bit of the text here, and then we'll go into a bit of the background. In verse 25, I want to focus on this older brother. The Bible says, now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house and heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what things these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. And answering, said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends." But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Let's have a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and Lord, we ask that you would take this very, very, very familiar story, and Lord, that you would unlock some truths that would speak to our heart, Lord, and, and remind us of some of the lessons that can be taught through this little pieces of scripture. Lord, we ask that uh, you would be very present with us, O Holy Ghost, Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in order to get the context, it's not going back to verse 11. It's actually going back to verse 1. Uh, the Bible tells us, Then, then drew near unto him the, all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Aren't you glad tonight that Jesus receives sinners man i'm so glad for that verse jesus receives sinners now some people look at this text and they uh, interpret that the elder son is a representation of the pharisees or the sadducees the, the nitpickers but it could be that but i like us to look at it just a little bit different now the, the whole uh chapter 
really focuses on two things, repentance and joy in repentance. And we see this unfold throughout the text. First of all, we see about the, the sheep, a hundred sheep. A man has a hundred sheep. And 99 are stayed put. One of them goes astray. And the shepherd goes and he looks for that one lost sheep and he brings it back. And the Bible says this in verse 6, And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Look at verse 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than the ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Notice the, the, the shepherd gets the lost sheep, comes back, and has a party. There's joy in the fact, hey, calling up the friends, hey, you know that sheep I was telling you about that was lost? Well, I found it. Yay! Let's get together. And Jesus says, well, if you think that was awesome, there's a joy in heaven that you can't see, but it's going on. Over one sinner that repents. Then the Bible tells us, not just about the 99 or the 100 sheep, but these 10 coins, and the woman loses that one coin. And I'm not going to go into all the nuances of what it means. All I'm saying is that she had 10 coins. She loses one coin. She goes about the house and sweeps everywhere, looks where she pick, takes a candle, looks under the couch, and just looks everywhere. And finally, she finds that one coin. And the Bible says, and when she found it in verse 9, she called her friends and her neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. And then verse 10 again, we read, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. That repenteth. So we see a hundred sheep, one's lost. There's joy. And Jesus said, this is a picture of when one sinner comes to repentance. Same with the coin, ten coins. And then we get to two sons. And we know the story, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time breaking it down, but just in case there's somebody who doesn't know the story, we're going to go through it just real, real quickly. Two boys. The one, uh, the, the, the one son, the younger son, says to his dad, you know, give me the goods that are mine. And the Bible says that the Father gave us the portion of good that falleth unto me and divided, divided unto them, I mean the two sons, his living. Now, at that point, we don't know what, was, what his intentions are. Maybe he's going to invest money. We don't know. But the Bible tells us that he takes everything and he leaves and go off, goes to a far-off country. And I can just picture him. He's got you know, a suitcase here and a couple under his arms. And he's got a, a backpack on. And you know, he's carrying everything he's got. And he's going into this far-off country. And then the Bible says that he begins to have great party with all kinds of people. And uh, the Bible says that he wasted all of his substance. Now, you know, I don't think that he planned for things to go quite that way. I'm pretty sure he figured he had lots of money. He was going to go and enjoy himself, meet lots of nice people, and uh, have a lot of friends and just rejoicing, you know, all the time. I think that there are a lot of people who think that that's what sin is all about, just having a, a really good time, but it doesn't work out that way. I've tried it. I've tried the, the booze scene, and uh, it didn't make me feel real good. I mean, I put away some of my griefs for a little while, but I woke up in the morning feeling a lot sicker, and I still had the problems. Um, I'm glad I don't have that thing going on anymore. It, it doesn't work. And then the worst thing happens is that a famine arises. He wasn't planning on a great famine. Now he's wasted all his living. His friends have taken off. 
They're gone. They, they, they were fair-weathered friends. They only liked him because he was buying the booze. That's all it was. Fair-weathered friends. And then the Bible says, what's he going to do? He's got to do something. So he gets a job feeding swine. Now, you have to understand that swine was something that was loathsome to the Jews. It would kind of be like us taking care of a, a whole herd of rats or something like that. We would just go like, oh, we want to do that. That's how they looked at hogs, you know. And then, uh, if you've ever seen the way hogs eat, it's kind of, uh, oh, time for Kathy's pill. So this is why we changed it to 6.30 originally because our church service starts at 5. So we would have missed that. But anyways, so, you know, and he's, he's, he got, he's looking at what the hogs are eating and he's saying, you know what, I wouldn't mind some of them things, the husks. But then something happened. The Bible says that repentance took place. I believe it happened in really three ways. The Bible says he came to himself. That's the realization. He came to himself. There was a revelation that his dad was gracious because he has more than enough that he gives his servants better than what he had. Then there was the humiliation. He, he, he decided he would come up with a, a speech. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. You've done something wrong and you figure, I'm going to have to own up to this. And so you devise a speech that you're going to come to your dad and say, Dad, this is what happened. And he devised a speech. But also he came to his dad. He came in confession and he said to, to his dad, he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son, but make me as one of thy hired servants. And then, I believe that that also was contrition, that he, he came with humility. And I believe also with adoration because he saw the goodness of his dad. He didn't have respect for his dad when he left, but he had a deep respect when he came back. And then we know the story. Things changed. The, the dad, you know, put a ring on his finger, put a robe on, put new shoes on his feet. He hugged his neck. He kissed them. He received his son. The Bible says that he killed the fatted calf. He said to the servants, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's eat and be merry. They're having a party. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now let's look at the text that we're, we're talking about. We got a bit of a background, but let's kind of look at this older brother. See, I believe that this older brother is a picture of what I tried to draw for you in my opening story. That part of me that looked for justice. So I believe that this uh, elder son, if we could just look at it that way, and you'll see the point that I'm trying to come up with, was that he was actually a believer. And you'll see why I say that. First of all, we're going to see this that that elder son was working. He was working. Notice, the elder son was in the field. He was working. Now, listen to me very carefully. We do not trust in our works for salvation. Salvation is by grace, through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But, friends, it's good to be working. It's good to be working for the Master. The Bible says this in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And if we look down a few verses, we see that he said, uh, he said, lo, uh, and he said, answering said to his father, lo, these many years do I serve you. So our relationship with God is not based on our works. It's based on our faith in the finished work 
of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. But then the fruit of that salvation is that we ought to be serving our Father, our Heavenly Father. And if I see people who say, well, you know, I, I'm a Christian, and yeah, I, I mean, I don't go to church. You know, I, uh, I don't read my Bible. I'm not doing anything in the church. I'm not doing anything for God. I say, I, I, I'm doubtful that they've had any encounter with grace. The person who is truly born again has a change in their heart. So that works now are the fruit that grows on the tree of grace. That's what works does. It doesn't save us. It can't save us. It will never save us. We can never trust in our good works. And yet, even in this little auditorium, if I was to say to you tonight, why do you think that you would be permitted into heaven, I would wonder what each and every one of us would say. I'm very surprised sometimes when I talk to people who have been in Christian churches for a long time what they say. And dear friends, if you cannot tell me that I'm coming in Jesus' blood and Jesus' blood alone, then I would doubt that you have any salvation whatsoever. Right. But next, look at He was wondering. Notice what the Bible said. The elder, now the, his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house and heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. He was wondering. He, he, he came, and he, he's, there's a little distance off. He, he's hearing music. He's hearing dancing. And he's going, what does it all mean? One of the servants came out, and he said, what is going on? question for you this evening. Do you ever wonder about grace? Do you ever wonder and think, wow. You know, that, that great old song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It is, grace is amazing. And we ought to sit back sometime and just look and, and ponder and meditate my salvation is of grace. It cost God everything. Wow. He did that for me. Look at two things that took place at the cross. Main things. First of all, we see man's hatred towards God. What, what, what happened at Calvary is a demonstration of what every... Uh, person wants to see done with God the Father. That's what it is. In fact, dear friends, if we could, we would drag God from that throne and we would beat him to a pulp and put him on a cross. That's what we would do. That's the sinfulness of man. That, that, that is the hatred of God. That, that's, that's in us. We would say we would not have this man to rule over us. Some of you saying, no, that's not true. But it is true. That, that's what man does to God. It crucifies him. We also see at the cross the love of God. Not because we were good, but because we were evil. The love of God. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says that we were enemies with God through our minds of wicked works. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. We've turned everyone to his own way. There is none that understandeth. There is none that doeth good. And yet Jesus died for us. The Bible says, for God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, we ought to be amazed. We ought to wonder at grace. You know, and the problem with a lot of people in Christian churches today is we've lost the wonder. We can look at that old cross, never shed a tear, never ponder and say, oh God, if you did that for me, I will do anything for you. 
Some of us, we just never have gotten to that place and thought to ourselves, what's it all about? What it's all about is that Christ Jesus died for sinners. That's what it's all about. If you haven't come to that place, friends, it doesn't matter what you've done. In terms of getting saved, I, I mean, there are, I've heard people say things like, hey, who wants to go to heaven? People put their hands up. Oh, there's 30 people got saved. That's not salvation. You've got to come to the cross. You've got to come to Calvary. But next, we see that he was wrathful. The older brother was wrathful. Look at what it says. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, verse 27, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. Look at verse 28. And he was angry and would not go in. He was angry. And I can picture this. Uh, party's going on and he's stern. Man, that just isn't right. He's mad. Maybe he thought to himself when he, you know, one day, one day that my younger son, brother, I should say, is, is going to come back. And then we're going to see what my dad's going to do. Oh, my dad, he's going to be so mad. There's going to be punishment, bad punishment. Oh, I wouldn't want to be my younger brother when he comes back. Maybe he thinks, well, there'll be banishment. You know, that's my younger brother's going to come and dad's going to say, Get away. I don't want to have any part of you. Maybe even a demotion. You're no longer my son. I don't want any part of you. Maybe he thought that. I don't know. Maybe he thought that his dad would say, look it, you are going to be put in prison for the way you behaved. He probably said, you just wait. You just wait. Till dad gets a hold of you. And you know what? That didn't happen at all. The dad just loved on his son, hugged his neck, kissed him, and gave him gifts. And that really made that older son mad. I can get that. I, I can picture that happening. Doesn't make sense, does it? Grace doesn't make sense. Next thing, he was weighing. Look what the Bible says. And he says to his dad, therefore, the, therefore uh, came his father out and entreated him. The, the dad came out and said, hey, son, what's, what's happening? And his son says these words. And he said to his father, lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time my commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. He's saying, Dad, on this side is me. I've served you many years. I've not transgressed your command. Never. You never gave me anything. By the way, that probably isn't a good way to treat an obedient son for serving. I mean, I think we ought to encourage one another and tell people, hey, you did a good job or something of that nature, whatever. We ought to... We ought to do, but his dad didn't do that. And then the Bible says, listen to this. And he said, but as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed the fatted cow. He said, dad, here's me. Here's the brother. Put him in a scale, dad. Here's me. Here's my brother. It doesn't line up. It is not, it is not, it is not fair. Doesn't add up. And you know what? The older son was right. It's not fair. It just isn't fair. Grace is not fair. Aren't you glad grace isn't fair? <laughs> Don't ever say, I want what I deserve. You deserve the eternal chains of incarceration. And by the way, uh, notice what the Bible says in verse 29. It says, Lo, these many years. We get the impression that that older son 
had always been obedient. No, it doesn't say that. He says, Dad, these many years, how many years? I don't know. Could have been two. Could have been three years. We know that the Bible says that he divided unto both boys their living. One took off. The other could have stayed back. And maybe that was the point of his salvation. I, I really don't know. But we know this, that the older brother had to come the very same way that the younger brother came. In confession, in repentance, in faith. That's the only way. Grace is not fair, and the older brother was right. But next we see he was wrong. 100% right and 100% wrong. Notice the Bible says, verse 31, And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Notice the Bible says that he called him son. I don't believe that we could call the Pharisees son. He called him son. And then uh, the older brother, like I said, the brother had to come the same way. He had to come by the cross. And he said, notice, he says, Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. The Bible says in, in uh, Romans chapter 8, And he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not freely give us all things? Dear Christian, you know what? The Bible says that God has given you all things. But some of us don't live up to our inheritance. Some of us grovel. And therefore, we can look at the, 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 that new Christian that just comes along and we say, it ain't right. That, that, that new Christian, everything seems to be going well for him. We look down upon it. We say, it doesn't make sense. Why? And then you get these, I ever have this, you've seen this before? Gifted people. Very gifted. Very gifted charismatic, you know, nice people to be around. Gifted with all kinds of gifts and then they backslide. You ever met those kind of people? And then they come back. And then they get plugged right back into the church. Well, they're the greatest singer in the church. They're the greatest piano player in the church. They're the greatest people there. And we, we put them back and we say, that isn't fair! It's not fair. Grace just isn't fair. Grace is being dealt to us what we do not deserve. Verse 32 says, It was meet or it was proper that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy son was dead and is alive again. And he was lost and is found. In other words, the dad is saying, how, how would you expect that we should take care of somebody who has received such a miracle? He was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he is found. Maybe that dad said, you know, I'd lost all hope. He didn't because he was looking for him. And you know, maybe there are people in your lives where you're thinking to yourself, maybe there's just no hope. Let me just tell you this. That's exactly what my dad said about me. There's no hope for Eric. He would be the last person on earth to get saved. That's what my dad said. But that's not what happened. God answered the prayers of my mom and dad and my brother and others that I would come to faith in Jesus Christ. And I did. And now I'm going out and I'm serving Jesus Christ. Not because I'm good. Not because I deserve it in any way, shape, or form. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's me. 
That's me. And I don't know, maybe there's somebody here this evening. You say, I want that salvation that you talk about. Well, first of all, you have to come as a sinner. The Bible says he came not to call the righteous, but he came to call sinners to repentance. The Bible says that he came for the ungodly. He said that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I know it doesn't make sense. But you come on the promise that he said he would save you if you would just come in simple, childlike faith on the merits of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And maybe there's somebody in your heart that you've been praying for a long time. And you say, there's just no hope. There's hope. As long as they're still alive, there's hope. You keep on calling unto God. Now, I've seen altar calls that way. Who's got, a, who's got somebody who's, who they're praying for? I'm sure everybody's. We know that. But I'm going to just pray for two things. I want to pray, first of all, for the lost here tonight. He's calling sinners to himself tonight. If you will come, he will save your soul. Would you say, oh, I can wait. I'm going to do a little bit of living, just like this prodigal. That was God's grace there too. But friends, you're not guaranteed another day. You're really not. Um, I believe with all my heart that we are such fragile, fragile people. My daughter... 35 years old, 36 years old, almost died because she tripped over her dog. Tripped over her dog and almost died. And friends, when you think about it, how fragile life is, there's a, a million, two million ways to die. And nobody has guaranteed us that we won't die after we leave this place. So today is the day of salvation. I'm going to ask you to trust Jesus tonight. If you've never come to Jesus Christ before, I'm going to ask you to believe on him tonight. There are people in this church who want to help you. People in this church that are praying for you even now. And God is moving. So let's respond in faith. Let every head bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around. I want to offer a prayer for you this evening. Maybe you're here this evening and you're without Christ. Oh, you, you may be a good person. You might be able to fool your mom or your dad. or your, You might be able to fool your kids. You might be able to fool your wife. You might be able to fool your pastor. But you can't fool Jesus. And, and maybe you're here tonight. You've never trusted in Him. You say, you know, my life is not going very good don't come to Jesus just so that he fix your life. Go to Jesus because you need your sins forgiven. I, I preface it that way because I know of a family that have put their faith in Christ. And this last year has been one roller coaster. You might trust Jesus and your life might get to be a bit more of a mess. But friends, let me tell you something. That without Jesus, you've got nothing. You're here tonight, and you say, Preacher, pray for me. I want to trust Jesus for my salvation. I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand real quick. I'll acknowledge that hand, and I will pray for you. That prayer will not save your soul, but I'll pray for you. Is there anybody like that this evening who say, Preacher, pray for me. I want to trust Jesus for my salvation. I've never, ever gotten saved before I, I I've, I've tried some things but I know in my heart that I'm lost Jesus wants to save you tonight I'm not going to prolong it I'm just going to ask you slip up your hand and I'll pray for you
And with every head still bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around, I know that there's likely those here tonight who do have a burden for loved ones. We ought to have a burden for all of Nanaimo. Lord, I ask that you would hear the cry of our hearts. And Lord, bring us back the prodigals, O oh Lord. Give us souls for our hire. Lo oh God, help us to reach the lost for Jesus. And then, Lord, help us not to be nitpickers. Help us, Lord, to help those when they come. Lord, sometimes these new believers come and they're, they're an awful mess. Help us not to look, look down on them, but to love them, to help them, to, to, to teach them well. Not to be angry or spiteful. Lord, I ask that you would do a great work in this church. Lord, I ask that you'd bless the pastor and Miss Vera. Pray, Lord, that you'd multiply the numbers of this church. Pray, O oh God, that you would indeed give them their own building or their own piece of land, O oh God. Pray that you'd help them financially. Pray, O oh God, that this would be a birthing place for souls, a nursery for new believers, O oh God. Help each one to be prepared to disciple somebody. Give us the right heart, Lord, and the right attitude. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. You go ahead and open up your psalm books. Psalm 388. It is 388. Memory works correctly. So, 388. Have thy own way, Lord. 